Hello, I'm Alec Avdokov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. Thank you all for waiting to listen for my hiatus of two weeks. It seems forever since I have posted any content, and for that, I apologize. Since I last left you, I had an insane two weeks. I began my music history class and had to drop it because I had not taken a prerequisite that was needed to take the class. I then had to switch it with pop culture, and I volunteered at a professional golf tournament in Columbus, Ohio, called the Memorial Tournament. Truly, it has been a dizzying week. But it feels amazing that I am getting back to uploading podcasts again. While I was away, I reached and passed 100 downloads on Podbean. This is a milestone for me, and I just want to say thank you for listening, and I hope you are prepared for more history. There is one last thing before I get to recap of what has happened in our story. As of yet, none of you has gone on my Patreon website to help financially support me. Remember, that there is limited time before I have to upgrade on Podbean. I have already uploaded over an hour of content with a little over three hours to go. All I need is for nine of you to pledge one dollar a month and I can continue. You will also get exclusive content that only Patreons get to listen to. Without your support, I cannot continue. Thanks for bearing with me, but I appreciate all of you out there listening. Before I continue on to recap, however, I must answer a brilliant question that my girlfriend asked me about the last episode. I said that without Frederick Wilhelm, the great elector, there would be no Frederick the Great. She asked why that was. My response to that was that the great elector was the great precursor to Frederick the Great. He set up the foundation for what Frederick the Great would build upon. The Great Elector was someone that Frederick the Great could look up to and emulate his work to help the people of Brandenburg and later Prussia. Thank you for that wonderful question, and I would love to hear more. Now, on to the episode. The last I left you was in 1688 in the city of Potsdam. The Great Elector was taking his final breaths and taking stock of his great legacy of what this new thing he created. Brandenburg went from the sand-ridden place that was kicked around to a fairly sizable regional player. So far in this series, we have had the microscope of history squarely on Brandenburg and its surroundings. This is simply because those are the lands that Frederick the Great would eventually rule, and we need to know the history and context about why this specific monarch has the legacy he has. However, today we will divulge from this narrative, to focus on a different player within this story. This character has been in the shadows of our story for a while and is now jumping into the spotlight with great fanfare, France, and specifically Louis XIV. France, you may ask. I came here for good, clean Prussian history and you give me France? Now hold your horses, good listener. Let me get to why I'm talking about France. The slow decline of France from a continental superpower in Europe to the eventual powder keg of revolution is the great story of the 1700s and the big name that brought both the greatness and the downfall of the monarchy was Louis XIV. Another thing too is that French is the language of the courts in Europe. Heck. Frederick the Great almost exclusively spoke in French and wrote in French. He had a near obsession with everything French and France. Without Louis XIV making France the status that it became in its golden age in the late 1600s, Frederick would not have followed in Louis's footsteps in creating a kingdom of enlightenment, culture, art, and of course, military triumphs. Those are the main reasons why I shall be talking about the reign of Louis XIV and the rise of France during this time period. Another reason is that his reign was so ding-dang long. 
Louis was the king of France for 72 years and 110 days. He was the king when the Thirty Years' War ended and when the Spanish Succession War ended. He also deserves a biography series unto himself, as I am giving to Frederick the Great. He was essentially the Justinian of France. You remember Justinian from your middle school history class, right? He was the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, who dreamed of reconquering the Roman Empire and managed to take back Rome. Well, Louis XIV was similar to Justinian. He had amazing military and cultural triumphs, while also spending so much money that the state he left his country in was weak when he left it. This is the paradox of great rulers. In order to reach personal prestige, one must incur some suffering and misery on their subjects. Would you rather have a series of unremarkable leaders that kept the country stable, or one great leader followed by unstable chaos? I would love to hear your feedback from you guys on that. Now, on to the mini version of the life and times of Louis XIV, simply because he is important to the outcome of Frederick the Great's reign. Louis XIV was born Louis de Donnet on September 5th, 1638, in the palace of Saint-Germain. In this time of arranged marriage, his mother and father had no love for each other and hardly even slept in the same bed together. It was either through the official story of a stormy night that brought the couple to conceive Louis, or his mom was simply pregnant with another man's child. Either or. Louis was the heir to the throne of France and became king when he was just four years old in 1643. That's right, a toddler, hardly old enough to speak was the king of the most powerful kingdom in Western Europe. So, whenever you think your child is entitled, I mean, they probably are and deserve discipline. Anyway, the point is that that is a ton of power for a little boy to hold. So, how did this whole little boy thing on the throne of all of France work? They used the old-fashioned regency trick. See, as Louis was obviously not yet of age to rule on his own, he had his mama, Anne of Austria, ironically more of a Spaniard than an Austrian, to be the regent, or the co-ruler of France. So basically, the queen mother of France was pulling all the strings instead of the boy. This was the arrangement until he gained royal power in 1661, as I said in the last episode. The main conflict that Louis had in his early reign was ironically the same as Frederick Wilhelm's early reign. Louis wanted to be sure that the nobles knew who was boss. One major way that he made sure he had authority was to switch the attention of the nobles from the actual governance of the country to that of court shenanigans. He had the old strategy of throwing bread and circuses to distract the nobles. See. Louis wanted to be sure that he had a secure power base, so he built up an old hunting lodge that was outside of Paris. This tiny place was called Versailles, and would eventually become the greatest palace in all of France. If you ever have a chance to go to France, please go to the palace at Versailles, and tell me all about the Hall of Mirrors. Anyway, this had the double effect of causing the nobles to go to Louis, where he could play his hand securely, as well as allowing Louis to create a highly frivolous court atmosphere. The court of Louis XIV is something that should be mocked, because it is just so weird compared to the standards of the 21st century. Now, Louis XIV was a big spender, but he also had a purpose for his spending. He figured that if the nobles started focusing on trivial matters, such as being the one to watch the king dress in the morning, yes, this was an honor, not a punishment, then the nobles would stop focusing on actually governing the country and rebelling against the supreme authority of the king. Here is a side note about Louis's court. There was even a chief mistress of the king. You heard that right. The king would cheat on his wife with someone and would not make it a secret. No, that wouldn't be French enough. 
He made it a great honor that one should sleep with the king of France and made the position of the mistress of the king a public position. What the heck? Keep in mind that he was the king in one of the most powerful Catholic kingdoms on the planet. All of this court scandal and extreme etiquette made the nobles less suited to govern, and they got used to the whole partying it up in Versailles thing. This meant that Louis would have to find actually competent counselors to help him reign, because even though he called himself the state, he still needed help to run it. I'm going to quote a small book about the reign of Louis XIV by J. H. Shannon, because I felt that this paragraph helps sum up his government. Louis's ministers were more professional than his predecessors. No longer could members of the royal family, princes of the blood, representatives of great noble dynasties, expect to be summoned to advise the king simply because they were who they were. Instead, the king looked to his controller general of finance and to his secretaries of state, experts in the field of administration and diplomacy in military and naval affairs. These ministers have sometimes been misleadingly described as middle class, a misapprehension which can be traced to the hostility expressed against these powerful new figures by members of the high nobility who had lost their political influence. Louis was too conscious of rank and dignity ever to employ non-nobles in such high offices of state. Their very position as royal counselors guaranteed their nobility, though, in fact, their background was a minor nobility. Therefore, he had a much more secure foundation in his own kingdom due to the compliance of his nobles and the betterment of his ministers to be professionals. Now, we get to my favorite part of the show where we talk about the politics of Europe with diplomacy and, of course, war. This time, we focus on France. In 1667, Louis felt that his kingdom was surrounded. Sure, the power of Spain had been decreasing since the reign of Charles I of Spain, or better known in this podcast as Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. But he had Habsburg Spain to the south, England and the Spanish Netherlands, today Belgium, to the north, and the Italian holdings of Spain, such as Milan and Naples, to his east, as well as the ever-present Habsburg influence in the Holy Roman Empire. However, Spain had an extremely inbred boy king on the throne at the time who was, not one, not expected to live long, and two, not expected to have any heirs. So, on some BS legal claim, Louis decided now would be a perfect time for a lightning military campaign in the Spanish Netherlands. The war lasted two years, and limited ground was given to Louis. Once that was over, he looked farther north at the Dutch with a suitable French-looking scowl. Once again, to quote Shannon, the Dutch were the natural enemy. Louis disliked their republicanism, their Catholic religion, and their trading ethos, all of which contrasted sharply with the principles of divine right monarchy in France. There, but there was also a sound strategic reason why the Dutch had to be defeated. France's efforts to strengthen her weak northeastern frontier would inevitably provoke a hostile response from the Dutch Republic, fearful of French domination of the Spanish Netherlands. This was the part of the last episode where Brandenburg joined in to fight against Louis to fight in the Rhineland with the Habsburg Emperor. Louis did not have the same success as in the First War because the Dutch were rich, they flooded their country, and were altogether a tough people to conquer. The French would later call in the Swedes to fight against Brandenburg, but we saw how that ended last episode. The Dutch war ended with Louis victorious against his enemies, but again taking limited ground. The Peace of Nijmegen ended the war with France taking some land in Flanders and the strategic fortress of Freiburg on the Rhine. 
There is an argument, despite his genuine wars of aggression against his neighbors, that his grand strategic plans were defensive. Louis had in his mind the security of France, rather than conquering vast swaths of territory in Europe, as Napoleon would later do a century after Louis' reign. This was the idea that French should not overstretch themselves beyond their capacity to defend themselves. The last war I will talk about is the Nine Years' War that lasted from 1688, the year the Great Elector died, until 1697. In 1683, the Ottoman Empire besieged the Austrian capital, Vienna, and then the winged Tsars arrived. Louis XIV sided with the Muslim Turks against his enemy, the Catholic Habsburgs. However, the Holy Roman Empire would fight back the tide of the Turks, and with the help of Prince Eugene of Savoy, a man who I will eventually give a special episode to, they took the strong fortress of Belgrade. This left the Habsburgs in a more solid position in the Balkans and left Louis feeling insecure in his position in Western Europe. So, Louis once again invaded the Low Countries and Rhineland in 1688, and an alliance was brewed against him to contain French power. He met with the initial success, with the mighty fortress of Philipsburg falling to his forces in 1688. However, the geopolitical picture began to change, and it would seem that this would be the high watermark of Louis XIV's reign. See, in England, the people were tired of having a Catholic king that cozied up to France and called upon the Dutch Stadtholder to, or leader to invade England and make himself the ruler of England. Once William of Orange landed on the shores of England, it became a cakewalk because James II was very unpopular. The Habsburgs could also afford to focus their forces more directly against France because of their successes against the Turks. Did this mean that Louis would simply give up and entertain more guests as palace in Versailles? Nope. He redoubled his efforts to fight all of Central and Western Europe single-handedly. The war would be a stalemate, with the main front of the war being in the Spanish Netherlands. Louis's main holdout was that Charles II of Spain would die without an heir, and then his grandson would inherit Spain. However, this did not happen. Nonetheless, I shall have to make this a subject of another week. Spanish succession is going to be a tricky thing, and it deserves its own episode, along with the war that accompanies it. For a final rundown of what happened at the Treaty of Wieswijk, the treaty that ended the Nine Years' War, I shall once again quote Shannon for a final time. At the Rieswijk, Louis XIV agreed to withdraw from Lorraine and to return Spain most of the fortresses acquired by means of his Réunion policy, including Luxembourg. He returned his outposts beyond the Rhine, notably Freiburg and Philipsburg, to the Empire and recognized William III as King of England, despite the fact that his predecessor, James II, whom Louis firmly believed to still be the legitimate king, was living in exile in France. In return, the French king was assured of his position in Strasbourg and Alsace. The vulnerable eastern frontier looked less secure than after Ratisbon, but with Metz, Du, Verdun, Franche Comte, and Strasbourg, it was a good deal stronger than it had been before the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Besides, Louis now had the opportunity to strengthen his position further as the struggle over the Spanish succession loomed. With those foreboding words, I shall have to leave you there. Louis, for the first time, gave up territory in a peace treaty since he gained royal power. However, even though he was up there in years, being 59 when the life expectancy was just 40, he still had one last great fight in him. And because everything Louis did was big, you know that this war would be the biggest of his life. But... 
I will go back to Brandenburg next week, when we shall hear how this young man named Wilhelm will create a kingdom from sand. The very kingdom that Frederick the Great will reign. The kingdom in Prussia. With me talking about France today, I believe I shall have to conclude in French and say au revoir, mon frère, au revoir.